Okay, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. I'm reading this morning from the New Living Translation. It says this, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift of God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things that we've done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are, present tense, we are God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus. He created us anew. He recreated us in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things that he planned for us long ago. Father, I just pray that you would add your, uh, your anointing, the, the illumination of our minds and spirits uh, to the reading of your word. Lord, I, as we read it, help us not just to understand it, but I pray that it comes alive for us and that we don't just hear it and even don't just understand it, but that, we, uh, that we're moved in our spirits to do it. And I pray that we bring glory and honor in our lives to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, it, in just a few days, it will be the official beginning of fall. I thought I'd get some hallelujahs on that. That's exciting stuff, right? I, I know it was 126 degrees this past week, but I just wanted to give you all some hope today. Fall's coming, right? Sweating may endure for the night, but, but pumpkin lattes come in the morning, okay? That's not in any version of the Bible. I just made that up. Um, when, when, when you think about fall, you, you tend to, th- I think about bonfires. Thank you very much. Bonfires are very exciting. I, I, I have to admit, I am a bit of a pyromaniac. It's probably rebellion from my teenage years because my daddy was a firefighter. So, I, I, but I love, to, I love to burn things. Like, I just, I'll just burn anything. Right? I, I'm not picky. I know some of y'all are bougie about your bonfires. All right, I get that. I know some of y'all are like, well, this is cherry wood that I hand cut myself. It's been seasoning for three years exactly today. I keep track of, I, I don't need all that, y'all. I know your, your fire going to smell better than my fire. I'll burn anything. I don't care. I, I'll burn pine. I, I, I'll burn kudzu. I'll burn like grass trimmings, old furniture. I do not care, all right? I, I'm, I'm not above going and cutting stuff down just so I can burn it. Okay, so if it will burn, when I look around, if it is combustible, I will burn it. It belongs on the burn pile. Okay, I think though that sometimes our con that's our concept of what God thinks when He looks around at us that He just sees us all as fit for the burn pile. And it'd be easy to go there in your mind, right? When you think about how perfect and holy God is and you think about how sinful and messed up we all are. So whether, whether we've never been saved, maybe you've never been saved or maybe you've been saved but you've just messed up again for the thousandth time, by comparison, we, we must look like the burn pile to him. But I don't want you to forget that his ways are not our ways. His ways are higher than our ways, and his thoughts, thank the Lord, are higher than our thoughts. He doesn't think like we do, right? I walk up to a pile of wood, all I see is a burn pile. When Jesus, the carpenter, walks up, he sees potential. He sees possibility. According to the scripture we just read, he sees a big pile of masterpieces waiting, just waiting for his craftsmanship. See, I'm told that when an artist approaches a medium like a sculptor does to a large block of marble, they can already see what they're going to create. As a matter of fact, I've heard people say, I've heard artists say, the work is already in there. The work of the artist, the, the masterpiece is already exists in there. The work of the artist is just to use the hammer and the chisel to free it from all the other stuff that's piled on top of it. That's, a, that's an incredible way to think about it. The passage in Ephesians is foundational. If you've been to church for very long, you've heard this preached. It's foundational, and it's extraordinary for a lot of reasons. The fact that we are saved by grace through faith is amazing. The fact that our salvation doesn't depend on us and how good we can be 
is incredible. The fact that we have nothing to boast about except the goodness and the faithfulness of God for our salvation is incredible. And the fact that because of Jesus, in the eyes of God, we are already, present tense, a masterpiece in his mind, in his eyes. We, we are already the finished product. And that God gave Jesus our sin, right? He placed upon him our sin, and then he gave us the righteousness of Christ. We've been justified by faith. When we choose to follow Jesus, when we repent of our sin, we, we are justified by faith. And then he sets about the business of sanctification, which is the process of setting us free from all the stuff that's buried us and prevented us from, from being who he created us to be. So he said, we have been recreated, created again in Christ Jesus. So that means he took us off the burn pile and he started this process of making us into something fit for the work of the kingdom. So today's message is called uh, recreated or reclaimed from burn pile to beautiful, from burn pile to beautiful. And, and I want us to talk about the steps of this process of recreation, of, of reclamation, and, and associate it with something that might make it easier to understand. Because I want you to know, God's not looking for something to burn. He's looking for something to recreate. He's looking for something to reclaim. Now, I, I know we got little people everywhere. Uh, I'm going to need a volunteer. Is there a volunteer? And Cody, you're 30-something years old. Uh, come on, Sawyer. Sorry, come here. You raised your hand, Bubba. It's too late to put it down now. Come on. Come on, come on, come on. Here's what I need you to do. I ask you to come up here with me, man. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Do you see this one? Will y'all raise your hand? Jessica, Chad, you see them right there? Go, he's going to give you something. Go get it and bring it to me. Covenant life is not responsible for broken legs in the preaching of the word of God. All right. Can you stand there and be still long enough? <laughs> Can you stand here and be still long enough? No, that's all right. Uh, so this is, this is just an old piece of reclaimed wood. Show it to these people over here too. They're nice people. All right. You jumped out. Now your feet don't work. Now, okay. So it's, it's, it's dirty. It's beat up. It's had a hard life. See, like there's pine straw on it and stuff. So if it were up to me, what would I do with this? Burn it. That's right. Thank you very much. But, but in the eyes of Chad and Jessica Scarborough, this right here is gold. This is gold. This is a masterpiece in the making. That's why they had it when I asked them about it. Because they rescue stuff out of burn piles of people like me. And they put them through a process that recreates them and gives them new life. Okay, if this, if this is the wood right out of the burn pile, what do we think, what should we do with it first? Burn it. Calm down. No, we're not doing that yet. What, what should we do with it first if it's still right out of the wood pile? What's the first thing you think we should probably do? You should probably clean it, right? So we're going to wash it. The first, the first step of the recreation process is washing it, washing it. In this case, pressure washing it, right? Uh, you'd be surprised how much, how, how much things change when they get washed, when they get washed. I want you to see this in the scripture. Col Colossians 1 verse 13 says that Jesus has rescued us. He's rescued us from the darkness, the kingdom of darkness, and he transferred us in the kingdom of, into the kingdom of his dear son who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. So he, he, he rescued each one of us. We're all a reclaim project. Amen. We're all a rescue project. Ephesians chapter 5 says at the, at the very bottom and, and into verse 26, it says Christ gave up his life for the church to make her holy and clean. How? Washed by the cleansing of God's word. Amen. He washes. He rescues us. He washes us. 1 John chapter 1 verse 7. But if we're living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us or washes us from all sin. Amen. That's exactly what Jesus did for us, y'all. He rescued us out of the burn pile. 
He picked us up. He dusted us off. He washed us with the water of the word of God and with the blood of the lamb. See, some of you think you're too far gone. Some of you think, well, I've messed up one too many times. Some of you think I'm too dirty. I'm too beat up. Listen to me. There's no stain that's too much for the water and the blood to wash you. Nothing. Nothing. There is nothing that you've been through. There's no layer of dirt. There's no layer of grime that can hide the potential that the master craftsman sees when he looks at you. He looks at us individually. Dirty, dented, sometimes a little twisted, and not not being used for what it was intended to be used for. And the good news is he doesn't really need a lot of our help or any help from us. He doesn't really need us to, he's going to give us everything that we need for life and godliness. He's going to give us everything we need to to live the godly life that he's called us to. We just have to surrender ourselves to his hand. And I don't care if it's for the first time or the 10th time, it's always a good day to surrender yourself to the cleansing water and blood of of Jesus. That's what we just celebrated today, right? With baptism. They, the repentance and the cleansing of another masterpiece in the making. Amen. All right, Bubba. I got this. You can go on back and sit down. Thank you very much. We'll put this right here. I need another volunteer. Right there. I like the enthusiasm. Go on, honey. Uh, stop by right there. He's going to give you a, another piece. So, thank you very much. What's amazing to me is that the only thing that's been done to this piece right here is it's just been washed. You see, look at this. Let's let's turn this way. Let's turn all the way over here. Here we go. You see the difference? Can you hold both of them? You look strong. There we go. The only thing that's been done is that it was washed, but it's already changed a ton. I'm telling you, I've seen people come to the altar and get saved. And when they get up and turn around, they look like a different person. So it wasn't just me, right? They look like a different person. I know how crazy that sounds. I know how maybe old-fashioned that sounds. But repentance takes years off your face. Listen, forget Botox, ladies. Repentance is free. And it will change the way you look physically, and it changes the way you look spiritually as well. But that's not the end of the process. Salvation, or washing as we call it here, that's not the end. That's the beginning. When we get washed, he sees the masterpiece that you're going to be in his mind. And what Jesus does next is exactly what Chad and Jessica do. So they start to make, uh, make you look like everything that he sees inside of you. Jesus does that in our lives. He starts to make you look like what he sees. So you say, yay, that's very exciting. God's going to restore me and remove all this old stuff. Don't go yay yet. Because the first step was washing. And that's refreshing and exciting. And getting a bath feels good. The next step is sanding. That's not near as much fun, okay? It's a lot more intense. You see, God's already knocked off the surface level stuff, but in order to get you where you need to be, he's got to do a deeper work. One of the problems of the American church um, is that we've taught salvation as the end instead of the beginning. We've made it the goal line instead of the starting blocks. And now we've got churches full of people who stopped after they got washed. They had no idea that Jesus, the carpenter, needed to start the sanding process to get all the old ground in stuff out of there. The dents and the dings of the difficulties of life. The paint that you used to try to hide all the stuff that you've been through. All that stuff's got to come off. The sanding process takes all that stuff away. You say, John, listen, I got saved and it was awesome for like two weeks. And then things got really, really bad. 
right? Everything like fell apart. And I was thinking things were better for me before I ever gave my heart to the Lord. Anybody ever heard people say that? Yes. Yeah. You know what happened? You moved. You changed phases. You went from the washing phase to the sanding phase. And it's not fun, but it takes you back down to the raw material that God intended you to be in the first place. Before time and sin and, and just life got involved. The sanding's not much fun. And it makes a mess. But it's necessary in order to get you to the stage where you become the masterpiece that he had in mind. All right? You've been awesome. Can I have a high five? Thank you very much. I'll take this. Cool. All right, one goes down. Somebody else has got to come up. I need another volunteer. You're right there on the front side of the back section. That's you. Oh, that's my grandson. Hey, boy. <laughs> Listen, y'all. Y'all think when you skip church that I, th I always know it. If you ain't sitting in the first six rows, I can't see you. <laughs> All right? So if you're going to skip, sit in the back. All right. Come on, boy. Now, you see how nice this looks? How sanded and... See the difference? Show them the difference. All the way around. 180. Start over there. Good job. Stand. Yay. It's nice. You can see the real wood. You can start seeing the character. You can start seeing. It's amazing how far it's come. But the process is not over. Because once, once it gets you nice and sanded, then the next, the next part is the staining stage staining stage in layer after layer y'all ever seen anybody stain something you don't just pick the thing up and dunk it in the in the bucket right it's a layer one layer at a time and it's even and it's smooth but layer after layer Jesus will start to stain you he'll stain you with his love he'll stain you with his grace he'll stain you with his power he'll stain you with the gifts that he wants to place in you for the good of the body. If you do it right, staining will actually bring out the natural grain of the wood. It'll, it will reveal what you were always supposed to be the whole time. You say, John, what if my stain don't look like everybody else's stain? Not everybody gets the same stain. That's why we got Home Depot. Y'all ever gone on the stain aisle? They're like a thousand things. You should stay there for six hours trying to figure out what color stain you want. Not everybody gets the same stain. It's fine. According to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it's the Holy Spirit who chooses the particular shade of stain for us based on what best complements the way he made us and the purpose to which he's called us and every one of us has been called. You have to trust him to decide what's best for you. God is described as a craftsman all over the Bible. He, he, talks, he talks about God as a craftsman, especially as a potter, and we're the clay, right? And, and, and even the Apostle Paul in the New Testament talks about God as the sculptor that, that creates all these vessels for different reasons. Some he creates as fine china, and some's just everyday dishes. Some he creates old clay cups and some are goblets used for special occasions. The cups and the plates don't complain about it. They're just glad to have been created by the sculptor in the first place. And it should be the same with us. God rescued us off the burn pile. <laughs> right? So whatever future he chooses to give us is better than what was going to happen to us had he not rescued us. So it's up to him. He gets to decide how we turn out. Good stuff, Bubba. Yay. All right, you can go. I need one last volunteer. Yay, I got pre-volunteers. Come on, Kate, you can bring your friend. I know, man. <laughs> Old people, bad peripheral vision and stuff. Yeah, go over there, make a stop at the lumber yard. Aw, look how they help each other. Makes, makes me want to tear up. Here, you hold that. Oh, Lord, I know. All right, I'll turn this way. We've got to go all the way around. Turn that way. Go all the way back around. 
Y'all giggle a lot. Do you know that? Do you, do, do you only do that in church? You do that at home too. That's what I thought. Yeah. Is this not, this thing's come a long way, hasn't it? Isn't it beautiful now? It's really been through a process, though. It's been rescued. It's been washed. It's been sanded. Why is that funny? It's been, it's been sanded. You're just giggling behind this little fence post right here. I don't know. But Jesus doesn't just stain us. He also said he was going to seal us. He's going to seal us. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4 and verse 30. It says, don't bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he's identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you'll be saved on the day of redemption. He, he, well, that was supposed to say sealed in there somewhere. I got the wrong version, didn't I? There's about six different passages where it says the Holy Spirit will seal you to the day of redemption. So y'all go home and find it. Look for it till it says it. It says sealed. Okay? Just trust me. Just like the seal coat on a piece of wood, the Holy Spirit will help to seal and protect you from the attacks of the enemy. He helps us make sense of things when we go through difficulties. He, he helps us find purpose in the pain that we go through in life. All the things that would otherwise have left a mark on us, let, had damaged the finish, it just rolls right off because we've been sealed. The, the weapons might get formed, but they don't prosper because we've been sealed, right? And Holy Spirit just comes and just wipes it right on off, right? And you just keep serving your purpose. Now, the last part is extremely important, and I'm going to let y'all go sit down for that. Y'all been awesome. Y'all been, yay. Yay. Wow, that was intense. Yay. All right. <laughs> and that's why we have kids' church, boys and girls. The very last part is, uh, is really, really important. And it's another thing that's missing in the American church too many times. Because I don't know if you've noticed, but our culture has become increasingly self-centered. Right? Increasingly self-centered. Like, just go to the cereal aisle. There's 8,000 different kinds of cereal. It used to be Rice Krispies, <laughs> Corn Flakes. <laughs> that was pretty much it. Then they invented Fruit Loops and the world changed. Um, but you can get anything you want, any way you want it, customized for your particular taste. It's just become, it's become that culture. The problem is that doesn't translate well to the Word of God. And I think sometimes we get frustrated because we go through this whole process as an individual and we still feel like something's missing. And something is missing, it feels like something's missing because something is missing. Because the last step is that you have to join others. You have to join others. Yo, this is uh, picket, like fence stuff, isn't that right, Chad? This is fence material. Yeah. Uh, have you all ever s driven by somebody's house and they just had one of these standing up in the yard? I mean, you, you might have. I'd like the address because I'd like to swing by there today if you don't mind. Um, but that's just dumb, isn't it? No, I don't care how good you did on on making the wood turn out that way, that's not a fence. It ain't a fence until it gets with all the other pieces to accomplish the purpose that it was intended to accomplish. And here's the revelation that happens that gets offensive to people, especially in this day and time, but ultimately the process wasn't about you. It wasn't about you. It's about what Jesus is building and you have to place yourself in the hand of the builder and let him put it all together. The, the one thing that's impossible to miss, whether you're in person here or you're online, is this big old wood wall behind me, right? You, you can't miss it. It's gorgeous. Chad and Jessica built this for us about seven years ago. It is incredible. They used the wood in the old antique mall beside us. And, and took, you should have seen that stuff when it came out of there compared to what it looks like now. So they, they put it through this whole process, and then they did the final step, which is to put the thing together. We think of the wall like we call it a wall because we think of it as one unit. But that's not entirely accurate 
the wall is made up of all these little individual pieces that were intentionally selected and put through this same process. Look at, the, look at the pieces of wood. They're different lengths. There's different stains. There's, there's, there's just different parts of the process. And that's, that's not just okay. That's great. That's what makes it so beautiful. There are different needs in the kingdom. But look what happens if everybody will just find their place and do what they can. There's no place in the body of Christ for jealousy. Because we've all got our place. We just got to find it. We don't all have to be exactly the same. As a matter of fact, we shouldn't all be exactly the same. That's uniformity. God never called us to uniformity. That's, that's not the goal of recreation. That's not the goal of reclamation. He's not building an army of identical robots. What Jesus wants is unity. Each one of us with our different gifts, our different talents, our different experiences, our different personalities, and, and I started to say our different levels of crazy. Anyway, uh, coming together to complete the picture. Working together for the same goal, which is the cause of Christ. You don't need a team full of quarterbacks. You don't need a body full of arms. You need each unique part doing what only it can do in order to accomplish what you were intended to accomplish. Now, Corey, come on, man. You know why, you know why one of the commandments... Um, is that there should never be any sort of graven image of God. You all remember the commandments, right? Thou shalt have no graven image, right? Why is that? Because he wants to carve his image in each of us. There shouldn't be a need for a statue or a drawing or a painting or a carving of the image of God. The world should be able to see it when they look at us. And we surrender ourselves to him and the work of, of recreation. We look more and more like him as individuals and more and more like him as a united work of art. The, that piece of wood is beautiful all by itself, but it's not going to find purpose and fulfillment until it joins with the other recreated rescues from the burn pile. To the untrained eye, Sometimes a pile of old barn wood looks just like a burn pile. But you let an expert come around, and he knows that every individual piece tells its own story. The real story of your life is not what got you tossed on the burn pile. The real story of your life isn't where those dents and dings and scratches came from. The real story of your life is what happened to you after you put yourself in the hands of of the master builder and let him recreate you and reveal you as the masterpiece he already saw you be. So here's the altar call. You say, John, uh, you know, wh where are you in the process? That's what I want you to ask yourself. Where am I in this process? Are you in the process? That's maybe the first thing. Have you given your life to Christ? Have you surrendered yourself to, to, the, to the master builder to put you through this process? You say, John, what, what happened to just as I am? Why can't God just take me as he, found, as he finds me and just lets me be? Why do we have to go through a process anyway? Well, listen, I know that it, this culture has, has trended to, to, to that direction, right? Where it's just, this is just how I am and you just better be used to it. But that's never been the gospel. It's not the gospel. The good news is God does take you just as you are. But the better news is he's never going to leave you like he found you. Never. And it's not because he hates you. It's because he loves you. Every one of us has to surrender to the process of recreation. So we can be exactly who and what God needs us to be in his kingdom. So today, maybe you need to pray for strength in whatever stage you find yourself. Or maybe you need to repent for fighting this process so hard in the first place. Or maybe you can turn around and see what God's been doing in your life 
and be grateful that he loves you enough to refine you and use you for his glory. One of my pet peeves is that we got a whole lot of Christians who look like this now and those same Christians that forgot that they started like that. And so we get all judgy at people who still look like this, like we didn't, like we weren't on the same burn pile. That's why, that's why people don't like Christians most of the time. Because we forget where we came from. We forget to have grace for people who were just like us when some wise old saint had grace to tell us about Jesus. Y'all stand with me, please. I was trying to be short. Y'all are making me preach. Sorry. We're going to, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray and then this altar is open. It's always open for you to come and meet the Lord here. You can pray in your chair. You can pray at home. You can pray wherever you want to because God's everywhere. Um, and he always hears the prayer of a sincere heart as, it, as it's lifted up to him. We're going to pray and the altar's open if you'd like to come. Pray about the things that we talked about in this message or whatever else you got going on in your life. Because when you got this many people in a room, some of y'all are having the best time of your life and some of y'all are having the worst time of your life. Some of y'all are bored with the humdrum uh, repetitiveness of life. Some of you got issues in your body. Some of you've got mental health things going on. Some of you got big decisions to make. Some of you got financial issues going on. You can come and pray about any of that stuff because God cares about all of that. Okay? And then we're, when we're finished singing this song, we'll all be dismissed together, okay? Well, let's pray. Father, thank you for the chance to be in your house today. Thank you, Lord, for the chance to worship with our kids. And I thank you, Lord, for the, uh, for the amazing work of Caitlin and her team uh, that they do every week. I pray, Lord, that you would help us as we reflect on your word today and on what your spirit uh, may have impressed upon our hearts and minds. I pray, Father, that we'd hear what you're saying to us. And that we would, every person here today, would be surrendered uh, to this process as we place ourselves in your hands. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.